We're kicking off a series today called The Search for Meaning. And um, I think we're all searching for meaning in so many different ways. And I want to read just uh, two verses from Jeremiah chapter one. And this is the prophet Jeremiah. And he says this starting in verse four. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we just ask that, Lord, would you connect our hearts to your word today? Holy Spirit, would you be the bridge that if in any area of our life we're rejecting your word or your truth, that you would bring us back to truth today? Help us to understand more about who we are today by looking at you, Jesus. We ask that you would do surgery in our hearts, take out what doesn't need to be there, add what is missing. And we just come to the word today in humility, saying, speak, Lord, we're listening. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, amen. Amen. You guys may be seated today. Well, for me, uh, I mentioned last week that I've got three kids. And as a dad of three, I found lately that the only place that I really get to watch movies anymore is when I'm traveling, when I'm on an airplane. Anybody love to watch movies on airplanes? It's the best place to catch up. Um, I used to go to movies all the time, all the time. And then I had kids. Um, and I remember it was like, like now my, my time is filled with things like Coco Melon. Anybody know Coco Melon? And uh, Bluey, which thank God for Bluey, somebody. That's a show I can get behind. Um, some of the young adults in here are like, I don't have kids, but I watch Bluey on the regular. Um, except the dad in Bluey consistently makes me feel like a terrible dad. He's just, he's unattainable. He's unreachable. Um, but anyway, I was watching a movie on an airplane last summer, and it was the, um, the movie about Elvis, very creatively titled Elvis. And uh, I remember just being so enthralled by this movie. And I'm like, man, the guy that played the part Elvis, he sold out to that part. Like for like a year of his life, because the guy got delayed through COVID, like he just was Elvis. He just lived his life, did the whole, um, I'm going to jump in. What's it called? Method acting. He just jumped into it, became Elvis. And I love the way the movie was directed and edited and filmed. I was like, this is amazing. But if I can be honest with you, I never finished the movie. And I never finished it. She said, that's so wrong. I understand. I know. But I, but I never finished it because I knew where it was going. And I was so excited in the beginning. I'm like, this is a young man that's full of all these amazing giftings, right? He even has like, there's part of him that feels like maybe this is from God, maybe it's not. And a man that's life over time, he lost his way and it kind of begins to spiral. And, and I got a little depressed and I was like, I don't need this kind of negativity right now. So I just turned the movie off. And you know, it's interesting. Elvis is, is one of the most famous people who's ever walked the planet. When you can say someone's first name and the world knows who they are, how many know that's a level of fame that few people achieve? I'm not there. You say, Brandon, you're like, which kid born in the 80s or 90s of the millions of them, right? There's 30,000 Elvis impersonators on the planet right now, right? Most of them, obviously, in probably Memphis and Vegas, but 30,000 imp imperson uh, impersonators and a man that really had everything, but his story ends tragically. In 1977, he dies a relatively premature death. And the autopsy said it was because of obesity and drug-related issues and the stresses of everything that he went through in life. And, you know, there's an old Reader's Digest article about Elvis I came across years ago. And for some of you, you had no idea what Reader's Digest is. Your, your Gen Z is showing right now. And uh, you don't have to read magazines in the bathroom anymore. You just you bring your phone, which is disgusting, by the way, right? I, like to, I don't touch anybody's phone. I'm like, That's, I don't want to touch that. Um, but in an old Reader's Digest, they interviewed his wife, Priscilla, and Priscilla Presley had this to say about her husband when asked, do you think Elvis achieved his purpose in life? Do you think he felt like he had meaning in what he was doing? And Priscilla Presley said this, Elvis never came to terms with who he was meant to be or what his purpose in life was. He thought he was here for a reason, maybe to preach or to save or to serve and care for people. And that agonizing desire was always in him, and he knew he wasn't fulfilling it, so he'd go on stage so he wouldn't have to think about it. I wonder if some of us just keep on going in life so we don't have to really think about these questions. So he just kept doing what he was doing. You know, there's a pastor who once said this, that the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but living without purpose. That we think death is the great tragedy. He said, no, 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 it's life without purpose. It was Thomas Carlyle, a British philosopher, who said, a person without purpose is like a ship without a rudder. Here's a profound reality. Who you are will determine what you do. Let me say it this way. How you see yourself will determine how you live your life. But the difficulty is this, that meaning and purpose 
evade a lot of people in life. There's a lot of people who have lived and are living right now that never really understand if they're here for a reason and if in fact they are, what is that reason they're here? Which is a shame because how many of you know we've only got one life, right? As the philosopher Eminem once said, we've only got one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow this opportunity. Okay, we've all read his work, we know. We got one life, right, one chance. You know, the first sermon I ever preached, I was 15 years old. I didn't preach in a church because no 15-year-old has business preaching in a church. But I was actually preaching as part of a, a national youth competition in a category called short sermon. So I know what you're thinking. Like, Brandon has never preached a short sermon in his entire life if you've been at Union City. But it was a five-minute max. I had a fully memorized four-minute and 56-second sermon. And that sermon was entitled One Life, One Chance. And as a juiced up 15 year old just coming out of youth camp, like I was ready to preach to some people because I'm like, I'm 15, I'm grown. Let me teach you a little bit about your life. And I was just going in. You know, I grew up in the Assemblies of God Pentecostal church, so I was stomping on stage. I was shouting a little bit. It was pretty great, I'm going to be honest. And, uh, but in this, what I was trying to get across to people was like, guys, life is short. I even started the whole sermon with the countdown. Super cheesy. I was like, five, four, three and everyone's looking around like what's about to happen and I was just trying to build tension in the moment you know but I was trying to get this point across at 15 that life is short and I don't tell you this to stress you out today where you leave like more stressed than you walked in like I got to figure this out but more to ensure that all of us are living with intentionality you've got one life so do not go through life not knowing how God created you and who you are meant to be because life is too short to waste it wondering and wandering is what a lot of people do. So let's not be people who live without purpose. Let's not be people who are a ship without a rudder. So what I'm doing today in a series that'll last probably four or five weeks, I'm actually kicking off a two-part message. And so today I'm going to give part one, and next week my wife's going to give part two. Probably be a little better next week. So, but what we want to do is, is we want to we talk about this idea of purpose, and I want to talk about two core realities that we find in Scripture about human beings and purpose, human beings and meaning. And here it is, it's very simple in the way that this is constructed, but I hope profound as we unpack this. And here's the reality, and it's this. You were created, number one, on purpose, for a purpose. This is what we're gonna cover over the next two weeks. You were created on purpose. I wonder if anybody knows that today. You were created on purpose, and you were also created for a purpose. And so over the next two weeks, we wanna answer two fundamental and sequential questions, and these are the questions. Does my life have meaning? And if so, what am I supposed to do with it? Does my life matter? Does it mean anything? And if it does, what am I supposed to do with it? So let's talk about this question. Does my life have meaning? And attempting to answer perhaps the biggest question anybody can ask. Well, really, a lot of modern thought today is around the idea of meaninglessness. You know, most of philosophy and many of the world's great thinkers, you know, rather than what they're uh, writing and rather than what they're giving to the world, having this bend toward meaning and purpose and design, actually the arc of human history and the arc of philosophy is having this bent toward void and meaninglessness, right? That life doesn't really matter. And here's the reality. If life doesn't have meaning, that means that you don't have meaning and therefore nothing you do has meaning. It was the, uh, the French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, who said, man is a useless passion. It is meaningless that we live, and it is meaningless that we die. Uh, the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, he says, the only absolute knowledge attainable by man is that life is meaningless. I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, Brandon, that was a, that's exactly what I need to hear today. <laughs> I wonder if you're feeling encouraged in church today. There, these guys are pointing toward, hey, the more that we dig into it, the more we are concluding that there is no meaning to any of this. But can I spend the rest of our time today actually encouraging you? Because here's the reality. In stark contradiction to modern philosophy stands the word of God that is rife with purpose and meaning and design and intention. And it's rife with the idea, this narrative that infuses purpose into every breath you take. So here's a reality that I heard when I was in youth ministry. My youth pastor said that if your heart is beating, your life still has meaning. That if you're breathing, you have meaning, there's purpose to your life. You know, part of ascribing to the Christian faith is the unwavering assertion that we are not the results of a chance disturbance in the cosmos, 
but we are divinely and deliberately created by a creator. You were divinely and deliberately created by our creator, God. So what I want to spend the rest of my time doing is building out three points and three ideas from that exact understanding that the way that we're created reveals three primary things about us. And the first thing is this, number one, is it reveals intentionality. It reveals intentionality. Now, if you'll allow me for a few moments, I want to build the case for intentionality, not just in the way that God created humanity, but in the way that God created you. That there's great intentionality behind you and who you are. Let me, let me say it this way. God created you on purpose. Tap somebody next to you and say, he did it on purpose. He did it on purpose. Some of you, that's your nightmare. You're like, do not make me tap or talk to my neighbor. I don't want to do any of that. So I'm sitting away from people right now. Now, we see this play out originally and clearly and most clearly in the book of Genesis. And so we go all the way back to the beginning. If you have a Bible, you can open up to Genesis 1. I'm just going to reference a few things in it. But basically, in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God is creating. He's making everything, right? There was nothing. There was void. And then God begins to do what only God can do and create something out of nothing. And you're going to notice the language used by God to bring these things into being is consistent throughout right? If you go to the narrative, it says this, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. He goes on to say, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And so the repeated refrains throughout the Genesis 1 creation story is God said, and let there be, which means that everything is being created by the effectual word of God, which is one of the reasons as humans that we stand on the promises of God, because it means this, that if God speaks it, it happens. If God says it, it is so. So this is what God is doing. He's creating by his words and the entire universe is being created. But then we move on down to verse 26 and the language begins to shift a little bit. And I think if you're not paying close attention, you might miss something that I think is relatively profound in the Genesis narrative. And it's subtle, but I wonder if you can see it. It says, then God said, not let there be, but he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so the language changes and is totally different as if God is saying, what I'm making now is entirely different from everything that I've made before. There's something unique about what I'm making now. And what is he in the process of making? Humanity, right? He's creating humankind. So then if we go to Genesis chapter two, which is another creation narrative, and it kind of gives us a little bit more insight, especially around the creation of people. And in verse seven, it says, then the Lord God formed, everybody one time say formed. He formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So please hear me when I say this. This is what sets apart humanity, not from creation, but it's what sets us apart from within creation. So we are part of God's creation, but there's something different about you than the animals. You may not realize this, but there's something different about you than your dog. I know my dog has a soul, like they're a living you know, creature, right? But there's something different between us and everything else in creation. And if you notice this in Genesis, we go from words creating to hands forming. And again, if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss it. And, and now before you start to think, okay, well, Brandon, that's how God created the first humans, but I know how this works now. People now are just the product of passion and biology, right? My parents sat me down at 11 to let me know what, how this really goes. I know how this works. Unless you're the youngest child in the family like me and nobody had to talk with you. Is that true for anybody else? You just learn from the world, right? So well, we know how this works. Now, but here's the reality. As we survey the scriptures, I think that we can conclude with a large amount of certainty that this forming hand of God this intentionality is not just for Adam and Eve, but this is that God takes credit for forming every single human being in this manner. So when you go to the scriptures, now the same language in Genesis chapter two, we find in Jeremiah chapter one, what we read in the very beginning. So let's go back to verse four and five. The word of the Lord came to me saying this in verse five, before I say it with me again, formed you in the womb, I knew you. This word, this word formed, it's a verb. And a verb carries this, this picture of a potter molding clay into a unique and a useful vessel. Saying this is the intentionality. It's, like it's like a potter who sat down at the wheel 
And he's looking at us in our unformed state saying, what do I want to form this into? What do I want to create right here in this moment? And this was not just Adam. This was not just Eve. This is all of us. And we don't just see this picture once. I'm not going to draw this conclusion out of one reference in scripture. Now we move to the prophet Isaiah. So from Jeremiah to Isaiah. And in Isaiah 64, 8, it says, But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. Look at this. We are all. Who? All. The work of your hands. Not the work of your mouth. Not the work of your words. We are the work of your hands. God the creator, so please understand this. God the creator is forming, and he's fashioning, and he's creating you. There's an intentionality behind you, and it was not true just for Adam and Eve. It was not just true for Jeremiah or for Isaiah. I believe it is true for every single one of us. And if you don't believe me yet, let me keep going just for a moment. We go to David in the Psalms. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Psalm 139, 13 through 14, or 13 through 16. It says, for you created my inmost being. Now look at these words and the intentionality here. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And then the apostle Paul in the New Testament, in Galatians 1, he says, when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles which means that God is creating and God is planning your life before you ever even take a breath. Can I just say really quickly, this is one of the reasons that for 2,000 years, that valuing life in the womb has been a distinctly Christian value. Not necessarily uniquely, there have been plenty of other groups and people throughout history that value life in the womb, but this is distinctly Christian. And the reason is this, that the mother might be carrying, but God takes credit for creating. He says, while that baby is in the womb, it's not just biology. The hand of God is doing something special and unique for every single human life. And he says, I take credit for creating that life. And that's not to take away from mothers, right? You might be carrying, but God is creating. And for the men in the room, we're still doing a whole lot of nothing, right? So it's not to take away from the women, right? I've, I've walked alongside my wife as she's carried, and, and I watch what happens, and I watch what she holds. But please understand as for the moms and the dads, as you carry and you pray over that child and you dream and you choose a name, you are in direct partnership with the creator of the universe. And so we don't come to that child and say, now, who do I want you to be? Because how many of you know you're just going to put your unrealized dreams and expectations on that child? So we don't say, who do I want you to be? We say, God, who are you creating them to be? The job of the parent is not to decide who your kid is, but to listen to the voice of God to say, this is who I'm creating them to be. We are stewards of our children. We are not creators of our children. And so at our church, we do child dedications and we bring people up on this stage and we do this short ceremony. And the parents say vows and the church stands and prays. But one of the key things I remind our parents of is this. Yes, this is your baby. And yes, they look like you. They, they're gonna talk like you. And then when they're your age, they're probably gonna act just like you. But please don't be fooled. You are just the steward of what God has handed you. So child dedication is the moment, we have biblical precedent for this from Jesus as a baby, from Samson, from Samuel and others, that we give our children back to the Lord saying, they are in my hands, but they are still in your care and they belong to you. So this is what it looks like to be people that are created by God and we are foolish as believers if we ever forget it. Do not forget the intentionality behind how you were created. Now, the second thing, so we got intentionality. The second thing that we can learn through how we're created, number two, is about our identity. Intentionality and identity. Now, the question of who am I just might be the most pressing and perhaps the most distressing question in our current cultural moment, right? There's a question of identity in our world just as a whole. Have you ever asked yourself before, how do we know who we are? How do you know who you are? Right, is it something that we decide? Or is it something that we discover? Is it something that changes based on how we feel? Is it predetermined by our biology? Do our parents create who we are through the way that they raise us? Is it our personality type? Sometimes I've thought maybe it really is just up to Myers-Briggs. Maybe they determine who we really are. 
You ask some people, like, who are you? They're like, Enneagram. I'm a three. You're like, what does that mean? Like, what are we talking about here? Who are you, right? Or is it, is it determined off of our, our sexual preferences or orientation? Is it determined by our likes or our dislikes? But here's the reality. How we are created, again, gives us great insight for helping us to answer the question of identity. So yet again, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. In verse 26, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. I even love the way this is phrased, our image and our likeness. You begin to see the echoes and the shadows of the triune God, even from the first verses in Genesis. But he says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. So this idea is an idea that theologians for centuries now have referred to as the Imago Dei. Which I know sounds awesome, but really it just is Latin for the image of God. Now, if you want to sound cool with your friends this week, just sometime in conversation, throw out the Imago Dei, and everyone's going to be like, wow, you must read a lot. So just try it. It's going to help, I promise. But the Imago Dei. Now, what does it mean to be the image of God? Well, for starters, you've got to understand what it means to be an image. An image, uh, when something is an image, it means that it is a reflection or a representation of something else. So hear me when I say this. The image is not the thing. It is a depiction of the thing. Now, I think to understand more about this, we've got to go back to Genesis again. Genesis was written in the Hebrew language. Now, the Hebrew term for image is the word salem, salem. And that literally translates to idol or statue. This is kind of a new thing that I, I learned this week in reading. I'd never seen this before. But salem means an idol or a statue. Now, here's, here's what an idol is. An idol is a visible repre- representation of an invisible being. An invisible, representa- or a visible representation of an invisible being. So now, if you think with me for a second, in nearly every temple throughout all of ancient history, when people would go into a temple, there would be a statue of the God that that temple was dedicated to and that people would worship from within that temple. So that statue would be a visual so the worshiper could see what that God was like. Now, if somebody was worshiping correctly, they wouldn't worship the statue, but the statue would be the visual to get them to worship of the God that it represents doesn't always work like that, but that's ultimately how that would go. Now, here's, here's what's crazy and kind of blows my mind, is that according to Genesis and the God of the Bible, he essentially, by saying you're the image of God, he is saying that we are the statue, we are the image of God. And this is why in scripture, you may not have known this, this is why God says, thou shalt not make any graven images. God doesn't want us to build statues of him, first and foremost, because we can't capture his essence in a statue. But he says, I don't need statues because I've already made billions of them. So if you look at humans, right, humans are meant to reflect the nature of God. Now, we do this very um, imperfectly in our current state since the fall, but there's something about human nature that is able to show us at least a little bit about divine nature. There's something about human nature that can reveal a little bit about divine nature. And so I begin to ask the question, but what does this, okay, that's great, but what does this reveal about my identity? Okay, well, I'm the statue of God. I'm meant to reflect him and be the image of God. What does this mean about my identity? Let me tell you what it means. It means to be the image of God. It means that we do not generate our own identity, but rather we choose to receive and reflect God's. What does it mean to be his image? means I don't choose my identity. I receive and I reflect God's. G.K. Beale, in a profound book called We Become What We Worship, says at the core of our beings, we are imaging creatures. It is not possible to be neutral on this issue. We either reflect the creator or something else in creation. We either reflect him or we reflect something else in creation. And so often that something else in creation is ourselves. I'm going to say something that many of you may not like. But please understand that as a pastor, my key role in life is not to be liked. It is to preach the word of God. Now, if I can be liked in that process, that's great. That's just an added bonus. I like to be liked. Okay, I'm a people pleaser. But something in creation is is often ourselves. Let me say it like this. Self-identity really is a form of self-worship. And again, I'm coming coming at this from the image of God. I'm not teaching this to our society. I'm teaching this to Christians, to believers right now. And so if God created me to reflect him in his identity— but I only care to project me and my identity, I functionally create an idol in my own image. I become the statue, not of God, but of me. 
And I say, I therefore worship me, and I would like for others to do the same. And so for the believer, please understand that to determine our identity, we do not look horizontally to this world. We don't even look inwardly to ourselves, but we look vertically to our creator. Paul Tripp says this, we often buy buy the delusion that identity is tangible and can be found in the physical world. It is not, and it can't. Think about it. Our meaning and purpose is derived by faith from a vertical relationship with an unseen God, not horizontally from what we touch or feel or experience. When you seek the identity from horizontal or tangible experience, you're placing your hope in something that will wither and fade. Only God outlasts time. Only God avoids decay. Only God eludes chaos. Trusting anything or anyone else is a delusion, a delusional danger that inevitably will come crashing down. Because our identity is not here. It's not even here. It's here. If you want to know more about who you are, we have to know more about who God is. You know, is the late Tim Keller, one of the most profound things I think he ever said, he was preaching about Romans chapter 1, which Romans 1, written by the Apostle Paul, is a scathing critique of self-standards and self-definition getting into culture and into the church. In Romans 1, it says that they did not acknowledge God as God, and they did not give him thanks. So they, they quit acknowledging God. They quit coming back to God and giving him thanks, basically meaning this, that they no longer saw God as the source of their life and their identity. They moved on. God, you're not the source anymore. I'm going to find the source out here within myself or from something that I can find around me in the world. You know what Tim Keller says? He says that this is actually a, a, um, a version of what he calls divine plagiarism. Do you know what plagiarism is? I learned the hard way my sophomore year of high school when I got a zero on a project for one copy and pasted line. The punishment was too severe, but I learned my lesson. Plagiarism is this, when you take credit for the work of another person. And so what Tim Keller is saying is he's saying the modern self is doing plagiarism of existence and of identity by no longer giving God credit for the way he created you and the image of of God inside of you, but by you trying to form your own. So he says, when you're refusing to acknowledge God as the source of your life and your identity, you begin to take credit for the work. And the quest to invent a self through inner desire or cultural influence is a kind of divine plagiarism. You're saying, I'm taking credit for what God created, and I'm going to recreate that. And God says, "Uh uh-uh, I actually created that first. That's, That's my image, not yours. It was, um, I just went all the way to the top of my notes, so I apologize here. Richard Lentz in Identity and Idolatry says this, the irony of identity is that by looking away from ourselves, we are more likely to discover our identity. As an image is contingent upon the object for its identity, so the imago Dei is contingent upon God for its identity. Human identity is rooted in what it reflects. So let me ask you today, what do you reflect? Maybe a better question is, who do you reflect? What are you reflecting? Who are you reflecting in your life? Because to reflect God's image, we have to reject our own. Because we are called to take off our earthly, this is all that Paul really ever writes about. Take off your earthly, man-made, manufactured, culturally influenced identities and put on the identity of Jesus Christ. Paul says, you gotta take some stuff off so you can put the right things on. Now, I get it that this is what I would call some varsity level Christianity. I think there are a lot of people that follow Jesus or want to that never allow themselves to get to this place like Paul. Because the second, you know, when we're talking about salvation, I'm here for it. Heaven, sign me up. Freedom from sin and addiction, I'm here for it. I want to be healed. I want the things that God can give me through a relationship with Jesus. But when we dig deeper, And find out that a relationship with Jesus doesn't mean learning more of yourself and adding more to yourself, but actually it's defined by self-denial so we can take off self and put on Christ. That's where a lot of people say, hold up, that's actually not what I want. That's not what I signed up for. And Paul says, then what did you sign up for? Have you read any of it? What, What exactly are you signing up for? Because to follow Christ means that I no longer live, but Christ in me is what is alive. And ultimately, our lives are wasted if we merely spend our time trying to discover who we are rather than spending our time trying to discover who God is. Because the more I know God, the more I will know about me. The more I know him, the more I will know about who I am. And the beauty of the story 
is that we don't have to wonder about who God is. We don't have to wonder about who he, what he's like because as Paul writes in Colossians 1.15, he says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's not an image. We are, we are images of God. He says, no, 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 Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God is like, look no further than Jesus. If you want to know more of who you are, I would challenge you this week, open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read something about Jesus. And through learning about him, you're going to learn more about you. He says, look no further than Jesus. And then look at the lengths that Paul goes to, how sold out he is, not to his identity, but to God's. Galatians 2.20 that I referenced a moment ago. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. And I read that and I go, Paul, no, you weren't, bro. You outlived Jesus by three decades. You were beheaded at the Roman Forum. So what he's saying here is it wasn't literal. He's saying, no, I've chosen in my life to take on the crucifixion with Christ. I, I take off my life. I pick up the cross. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Is that the place that we've gotten to today? Are we wanting to take on and receive and reflect his identity or are we wanting to find, discover, and create our own? Because if we do, it will not be God that we reflect, it will be the culture. It will not be God that we reflect, it will be ourselves. And that's not what it means to be the image of God. You see, you're, you're gonna know you're beginning to live in this way when your core motivation in life is not for others to see or notice you, but to see and notice Christ through you. That's how you're gonna know that, hey, I'm, I'm getting this thing right. When we say my life's purpose is to glorify my creator and that people would see him through me. That's what, that's what it means to glorify God. It means that you reflect praise to him. You reflect honor to him. When somebody says something about you, you say, hey, that's great, I received that, but I wanna give that back to God. Glorifying God means that others' sights and attention are pointed to him and not to ourselves. So how we're created reveals, it shows intentionality. It teaches us about our identity, but it also reveals, the last thing is innate dignity. It reveals innate dignity. On July 4th, 1965, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached a sermon at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, called The American Dream. And in his sermon, he begins to preach about the image of God. He preaches about the Imago Dei. And, and he says this about the concept of the Imago Dei. He says, it is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. Not that all men have substantial unity with God, but that every man has the capacity to have fellowship with God. And this gives him a uniqueness. It gives him worth, it gives him dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation, that there are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard precisely because every man is made in the image of God. One day we will learn that. And we will know one day that God made us to live together as brothers to respect the dignity and worth of every man. What blows my mind is that this is a sermon given by a man who's recognizing the dignity, not in just some people, but everybody. Even those that at that point in 1965 despised him, and even so-called Christians who believe that they are the image of God, who would look at a man that looked like him and they would deny the image in him. I think one of the greatest heresies in human history is when people who bear the image of God will deny the image in somebody else. I don't know if you can gain to a greater, get to a greater level of heresy than that. That I'll say I'm created in his image because of the way I look, but you're not. And this was the great sin of slavery, the great sin of segregation, the great sin of racism that still is around today. It's to deny the image in somebody else. But Dr. King and scripture teach us that you have innate dignity, that you have intrinsic value not because others made it so, not because you have made it so, or that if you don't feel that you have value, not even because others failed to make it so, but you have innate dignity because God made it so in the very beginning. That the fact that he created you and formed you, the fact that you're made in the image of God means that you have innate dignity, which means this, that if you have innate dignity, then so does every other person on the planet. Every other person has dignity. I think most of humanity's problems would be solved if everyone understood this reality and lived accordingly. Think about some of the gravest sins across human history and still today, what's the core problem? Somebody has stopped seeing somebody else as the image of God. And when you don't see the image in somebody else, that's when you will enslave people. 
That's when you will capture people. That's when you will use and abuse people in every form or fashion. Jackie Hill Perry, a pastor and author, she says, I can find out what I truly believe about the theology of the Imago Dei by how I treat people. You'll, you'll realize that you buy the theology of the Imago Dei based on if you treat people like God would want you to treat them. Now, throughout scripture, God has taken very seriously the way that humans treat other humans. This is why after, you know, the world got terrible and God decides to send the flood and he takes Noah's family and they begin to rebuild humanity and society. And in Genesis chapter nine, as the community is growing, God gives a pretty severe command. He says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now this is, Old Testament, this is pre-New Covenant. I happen to fit in a camp of, I believe that God's grace can overwhelm even the greatest offenses. But what God is establishing in this moment in the Old Covenant is he's reminding us yet again how seriously he takes his image. That when somebody harms his image, he takes it personally. James writes about this as well. In James chapter three, he's writing about the tongue and he's writing really about our words. And he says, the tongue is a restless evil. He says, it's, un, it's an untamable creature. It is a world of unrighteousness, which if you've been on Twitter or the comment section on Instagram, you know this to be true, right? And then he reveals what is perhaps the most wicked thing that a person can do with their tongue. James 3 verse 9, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's image. James basically says, be careful to praise God's name and to curse his image with that same tongue in your mouth. Which means I believe that God would say, I don't really want your praise in here if you're gonna curse my image out there. That praise, you wanna make your praise null and void, then praise God with the same tongue that you curse his image. He says, that cannot be, that should not be. Why is this, why is God so passionate about this? Because he takes it personally. He says, that's my image that you're cursing. Remember, remember when Jesus so intimately relates with his people that he says in the gospels that whatever you do for the least of these, it's as if you're doing it for me. And whatever you don't do and whatever you withhold from the least of these, it's as if you're withholding it from me. So we see from God and we see from the son as Christ, as he walked this earth, that he takes it personally. Why? Not just because not just we're his creation, but because we are his image. Basically, it's this, that humans have been formed by God, by the hand of God, in the image of God, are filled with the breath of God, and therefore they matter to God. And if people matter to God, then we have to determine that people matter to us. Not just the ones you like, not just the ones you look like, but all humans. And the gospels even tell us, hey, you're good at loving people that love you, that look like you, that like the same things you like. You get this pity applause. He's like, that's fantastic. Even non-believers do that. He says, what, what separates believers is that we love those who curse us. We bless and do not curse. We love those who look like us and those who don't look like us. We love people who, who value what we value and don't value what we value. Let me say this, before next week, as my wife begins to preach a message on how to live on purpose, to know what you're supposed to do, can I just say this? It's impossible to live a life of purpose and not love people. So before we get there, what's my calling? What's my purpose? How do I walk this out? None of that really matters if you can't look at the people around you and see purpose in them. That's the starting point and that's the key. And this is why as a church that we care about things like injustice and we care about things like inequality and we care about our brothers and sisters, the image of God who don't have homes and who don't have food. And we don't just pray for them and wait to say, well, one day in heaven, it will be made right. We say, no, the kingdom is here now. So we bring heaven to earth now and we fight against injustice and we fight against inequality and we put houses over people's heads and we feed our neighbors. Why? Because God's image is in them. And it should break our heart when God's image suffers. And so before we talk about walking in purpose next week, can I just say, if you've been wandering, floundering, what is my purpose? Don't waste another day asking that question. Just get up and start serving people and loving people. And you will find more purpose in that than if God himself came to this earth and spoke to you what it was. Find purpose in people. And we can actually serve God best by serving others. I'd love for you guys to stand to your feet today. And just kind of in this space today, I wanna, I wanna pray for us here in a moment. But just kind of bring it back for a second that you have been created. So the question was, 
Does my life have meaning? And I feel like I can unequivocally answer that question, yes. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how you got here. You might, you might have parents who said you were an accident. You might not know your mom. You might not know your dad. You might have convinced yourself your entire life, like, I'm not even really supposed to be here. But just because you got here in maybe a unique way doesn't mean that God didn't have that plan already going and circulating. God is moving. God was forming. God was planning you. And that doesn't make you special, more special than anybody else. But it does make you God's special possession, his holy creation. And I don't know who that's for today, but maybe somebody just needed to hear that today, that you do have value, that God did create you on purpose. And hopefully next week we can begin to walk out what that looks like to then live accordingly. You guys will bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray for you today. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we don't sit here today, stand here today, just wondering what this is all about and does this matter? But your word shows us that it matters infinitely. Every one of these lives is of great value. Thank you for your hands that formed us. Thank you that you put your breath into us, effectively giving us a soul. Thank you that you were planning, that you were creating, that you were mapping our lives out before we ever even took a breath. And so God, remind us of the great intention of our creation. Remind us that our identity, Lord, is not found looking out, it's not found looking within, but by looking up to you. Help us to reflect your image and remind us of, the, of our innate dignity, maybe even more importantly, of the innate dignity of others. And help us to see purpose in people. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for your word. We pray this in your name. Amen.